All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's uh, just after one o'clock uh, here in Toronto. So we'll get started on uh, this uh, webinar. Um, today, we're very happy to uh, have uh, Rashid al makadim joining us uh, to give an overview of some of the, the really interesting, amazing work that he's been doing in um, assessing myocardial dynamics uh, with photoacoustics and cardiac elastography uh, in mouse models. So uh, this is um, Stephen Butters, by the way, um, product manager here at uh, Fujifilm Visual Sonics um, in Toronto. Um, we uh, have uh, some notes about the webinar here right off the top. Um, just for everybody's uh, notification, a, a recording of this webinar will be made available. So if you did uh, sign up, you weren't able to join or you have to uh, drop off uh, partway through, we will be sending out a recording of the webinar uh, a little while after uh, it's uh, finished up. Um, all of the uh, lines for everybody that's uh, joined in uh, have been muted on joining. If you do have um, questions uh, during the presentation, please use the, uh, the Q&A uh, button, send the questions uh, to us through chat. Uh, we will be answering those questions um, at the end of the session. Uh, we expect about 45 minutes um, duration for the presentation and then uh, some time at the end to uh, answer questions, maybe around 10 or 15 minutes. Uh, in the case that we get a flood of questions, which is always nice to have happen, if we don't get to them, we will try to follow up uh, directly by email uh, with uh, any questions that are uh, sent in that we don't actually happen to get to. So I'm happy to introduce uh, to you uh, Rashid al makadim He's a, a PhD student in the Department of Medical Physics at the University of Madison, Wisconsin uh, in an ultrasound imaging laboratory under uh, Professor uh, Tommy Varghese. Um, Rashid's uh, come through a, a great path. Uh, he uh, has a background in electrical and electronic engineering um, from uh, IUT in Agazapur, Bangladesh and then uh, moved uh, to uh, Wisconsin-Madison to get his uh, MS uh, in electrical and computer engineering from uh, University of Wisconsin-Madison, and has been doing some, some really interesting work on uh, a bunch of different areas of interest, but all really focused around cardiovascular research. I'm looking at cardiac elastography and uh, photo, both photoacoustic imaging and uh, applications of both of those in both preclinical and uh, clinical imaging. Of course, with a goal to develop um, some uh, estimation, motion estimation algorithms for cardiac elastography, and also to evaluate um, photoacoustic imaging as a complementary imaging tool in uh, some of the um, uh, cardiovascular research. So I will stop my share and I'll pass hearing rights over to Rashid. And he's just uh, transferring over there right now. And um, take it away. Thank you, Stefan, for the introduction. And um, thank you, everyone, for joining to the webinar. Uh, today, I'm going to talk about the assessment of myocardial dynamics using photoacoustic imaging and cardiac elastography and share some in vivo results that we have found in Miran Schemia model. So this is a brief outline of the presentation. I'll be talking about the basic principle of photoacoustic imaging and show some application in the cardiovascular research, and then show some in vivo experimentation on mouse model of ischemia and hypoxia, and then briefly talk about the basic principles of cardiac elastography and share the algorithm that we employ in our lab. And finally, in the presentation, uh, sh sh uh, by showing some initial analysis of in vivo data using the vivo strain from Visosonics and cardiac elastography. For background, the coronary heart disease, including the myocardial infarction, is one of the leading cause of mortality in the US, causing over 360,000 fatalities each year. MI results in necrosis of cardiac myocyte, which is typically caused by ischemia, and it can have fatal effect to the patient. Therefore, it's very crucial to have accurate and comprehensive diagnosis of ischemia. The Small animal models play a crucial role in cardiovascular research. These mouse models actually allow us to understand different uh, aspects of the cardiovascular research, such as it allows us to understand the pathophysiology of cardiovascular diseases. It allows us to evaluate the myocardial dynamics longitudinally for a disease state. And it also allows us to access the efficacy of novel cardiovascular disease therapies. But in order to achieve this 
goal from a mouse model is very crucial to have an accurate assessment of cardiac performance. And in this particular aspect, the non-invasive imaging model does play a pivotal role. So there are many non-invasive imaging techniques that can be used for imaging the myocardial dysfunction. Primarily, we are interested to use the ultrasound to look into the myocardial dysfunction uh, due to its real-time and inexpensive nature. And it also provides very high spatial and temporal resolution, which is crucial to do small animal imaging. So in this slide, I tried to summarize some of the techniques that has been used to look into the myocardial function. Uh, we start off by looking into the echocardiography, which is the conventional way of looking into the heart using ultrasound. These echocardiography images can be used both quantitatively and qualitatively. The qualitatively, the clinicians can access this image and then come up with a visual wall score motion to identify whether is there any kind of dysfunction in any part of the cardiac wall. And these images can also be used quantitatively. For example, it, these images can be used to derive the ejection fraction, fractional shortening, stroke volume, and so on to look into the microdial dynamics in a more quantitative manner. Then we can also use tissue Doppler imaging, which allow us to derive the myocardial velocity and the strain and strain rate as a quantitative marker. But the tissue Doppler imaging actually suffers uh, from a discrepancy uh, coming from the angle of insignification. And the researchers actually tried to solve this by directly estimating motion from the ultrasound images itself. So there the spatial tracking echocardiography and the cardiac illustrography come into the picture. So the, in the spatial tracking echocardiography, the ultrasound remote scene loops are directly employed to um, um, extract cardiac motion. And from the extracted cardiac motion, we can generate the strain and strain rate, which can be studied further to look into the cardiac uh, dysfunctions. So here, uh, this uh, spatial tracking echocardiography has been implemented in many commercial systems. For example, here I have a screenshot from the VivoStrain software from Visosonics, and I'll be talking more about that in my presentation later. And this is a um, this is a screenshot from a clinical system from GE, where this is used in the clinic to look into the uh, strain in the human patient. And finally, we have the cardiac illustrography. Uh, in principle, it is quite similar to the spatial tracking echocardiography, but in the cardiac illustrography, we make the use of the raw RF ultrasound signal to derive the tissue motion, which provides some added advantage, and I'll be talking in detail in the, my later part of the presentation. Then, uh, the, the previous slide, I talked about the different imaging techniques to look into the cardiac function. We can also try to image the myocardial perfusion directly. So here are some imaging techniques that has been employed to look into the myocardial perfusion. For example, we have PET spec perfusion imaging, then we have MR imperfusion imaging, and then we have the myocardial contrast echocardiography. So all of these methods actually requires us to have the intravenous injection of either radio tracer or some kind of contrast agent to have the contrast. But we are actually interested to look into the perfusion without any kind of contrast agent. And we hypothesize that we can use the photoacoustic imaging directly to look into the perfusion. So now let's look into the principle of photoacoustic imaging. It's an evolving real-time biomedical imaging modality that combines the optical imaging contrast with the ultrasonic spatial resolution. So what is the imaging process? First of all, in this figure, we are interested to look into the oxygenation of this tumor. So what we can do is that we can irradiate this tumor with short pulses of EM radiation and then they're the optical absorber, for example, oxygenated and the deoxygenated blood that is present inside the tissue will absorb the optical energy and then it will give rise to a rapid thermoelastic expansion of the surrounding environment. And that rapid thermoelastic expansion generates an acoustic wave which can be detected using the conventional ultrasound transducer. So in using the ultrasound receiver, we are actually detecting this wavelength-dependent photoacoustic signal, A lambda R, 
which has the the component from the laser fluence f lambda then optical absorption um, and then this thermoelastic expansion parameter which is a which is assumed constant then we are mostly interested to apart from the functional imaging in particular we're interested to find out what is the oxygen saturation in a tissue so there we can employ the pax spectral analysis to derive the functional imaging so assuming that laser fluence and then gusen parameter constant we can say that the received pa signal is directly proportional to the optical absorption uh, opposite optical absorption by the observer then assuming that we have two optical absorber the oxygenated hemoglobin and deoxygenated hemoglobin we can say when uh, we can say that in a single wavelength pa imaging we have the contribution from both and here the optical absorption co coefficient is actually equal to the concentration of the absorber multiplied with the wavelength dependent molar extension coefficient which is known beforehand then but here we have only one equation but we are interested to find out what is the concentration of both oxyhemoglobin and deoxyhemoglobin to solve this problem we can do multi wavelength p imaging meaning that we can vary the wavelength and then take multiple e images and then build this linear system of e and then we can solve this linear system of equation to find out what is the concentration of oxyhemoglobin and the concentration of the deoxyhemoglobin and from if we know the concentration of this then we can generate the oxygen saturation which is um, shown in this equation so this um, this uh, particular algorithm of extracting the oxygen saturation is already being implemented in vivo 2100 system and so that leads us to our motivation and objective of this work so we want to use a commercially available pa imaging system for diagnosis and real-time monitoring of myocardial ischemia in a mural model and then we want to perform a longitudinal study of left ventricular blood perfusion and we also want to establish a relationship between the functional and the perfusion changes associated with acute ischemia. So here are some literature review. So initial report of P imaging was uh, reported by a um, um, group of Roger Jem and his colleague. They use single optical wavelength PA imaging to look into the myocardium in young athemic nude mice. They had a frame rate of 50 frames per second. Uh, here I have an image from their publication where they have delineated this as a heart structure. Uh, as this is a PA image, it's very hard to clearly see the structure. But when they have put a gate and they, uh, at the heart structure, you can see in the M mode image that there is a periodic variation of the PA signal. So one of the key findings of this particular work is that it has shown that PA imaging can be a candidate for functional imaging of the heart. Then there is also a report from Liat L where they tried to use again single wavelength P imaging to study acute myocardial ischemia in rats. They have 10 of them. So their imaging was performed in an open chest setting. Their rats were imbuted and submerged in water for performing the coupling. And then they were mostly interested in imaging the ventricular and anterior wall. And they from the imaging using a single element transducer so they had to translate their transducer along this ventricular anterior wall to perform this 2d imaging so one of the key finding was that uh, they found out that there is a reported exponential uh, decay of pa signal intensity with time after occlusion so this leads us to our experimental protocol so we want to use the oxygen saturation as a quantitative parameter and use a linear array system to do the part imaging. So here is our experimental cohort. We had um, eight male 10 to 12 weeks BALB CJ mice. And in terms of experimental timeline, first we do a baseline imaging. Immediately after baseline imaging, we perform LED ligation to induce the myocardial um, infarction. And after uh, LED ligation, we have four imaging time points, which are the post-surgery imaging points, 30 minutes, 18 minutes, 120, and one day. 
and after the imaging is complete then we perform offline data analysis so we had two different imaging protocols so first of all this is the imaging protocol for the pa we use vivo laser imaging system uh, we use an lz 400 transducer whose center frequency was 5 megahertz and we employed an oxyhemo imaging mode which allowed us to perform the imaging at 5 frames per hertz and this is our pa imaging preset so you can find the detail about this preset in our recent publication in umb but one of the key point of this um, preset is this pa gain 2d gain and the persistence so we made sure that we always had the, the same preset because we were performing a longitudinal study and changing uh, this gain setting actually changed the estimate of the oxygen saturation and we also made sure that we are saving our tgc and image using same tgc every time um, along every time point over each mice we also had ultrasound imaging protocol for ultrasound imaging we collected raw radio frequency rf signal and also the machine remote signal and in for ultrasound imaging we used an ms 550d transducer with uh, whose center frequency is 40 megahertz and in this case um, we had a frame rate of 235 hertz and we were mostly interested into the personal long axis view so we collected this image for performing the analysis using speckle tracking echocardiography and cardiac elastography for p image analysis we use vivo lab in there are two tools for vivo lab to do the oxygen quantification the one is the oxygated tool which allow us to quantify the oxygen saturation it reports two different kind of oxygen um, saturation within the roi and then we have hemo g measure tool uh, which was reporting the total hemoglobin within a chosen roi for this experiment we were interested to look into the oxygen saturation average then we also used our high frequency b mode images to derive 2d echocardiography measurements for this we use the lv trace tool from vivo lab cardiac measurement package and in this case um, we use this 2d b mode image to extract ejection fraction and stroke volume as defined here we also used uh, the m anatomical m mode image for perform for calculating the fraction shortening to calculate this thing we again use the lb trace tool of vivo lab cardiac measurement package one uh, point to be noted here is that first uh, the it uh, uh, we looked into the our b mode scene and loops visually and find out that which area was impaired and then we get at that particular area to generate this M mode trace. And then we use this M mode trace to generate our fractional shortening. So fractional shortening is actually calculated, is used as a regional measurement by from a visual point of view. So for results, so I'm sharing some 40 percent imaging example that we uh, have. So here we, we have two windows at the right, you can see the PA image. So, um, there are some key points of this particular image for example we always try to make sure that our anterior myocardium is between 9 to 11 millimeter the reason being is that the maximum optical energy is focused at 9 to 11 millimeter in the vivo 2100 system then we wanted to make sure that our skin surface is as horizontal as possible to the transducer surface which which is shown here and we want we wanted to make sure that we place our skin surface at a depth of seven so that the reverb artifact appears at a depth of 14 which is away from our region of interest and other point to note here is that we were not getting any signal from the posterior my myocardium the reason being is that the most of the light optical energy is being absorbed from the anterior myocardium leaving very less energy for the posterior myocardium to generate any kind of signal so all the results that i'm going to report is basically looking into the anterior myocardium then we also perform 3d p imaging but for current analysis we have not used those so um, 
here is a result for the oxygen alteration for case one. So at the baseline, uh, you can see high oxygenation. Uh, I want to mention that red is 100% oxygenation, where the dark blue is 0% oxygenation. So as you can see in for this particular example, in the post-surgery cases, we are seeing reduced oxygenation in the myocardium post-surgery. Then this is one other example where at the baseline uh, you can see very high oxygen saturation, but as time progresses, you see very low oxygen saturation. So the, the, the other point to note here is that we face several challenges. One of them is basically the presence of suture. So in this particular case, as you can see, we are losing a lot of signal uh, due to the presence of the suture. So whenever we drew ROI, we made sure that we are not including any part which lost signal from the suture. So this is an example of such case. And then finally, this is one other example where at the baseline, you can see very high oxygen saturation, but as the time progresses, there is low oxygen saturation. But then we saw that there is a recovery of the oxy oxygenation compared to the baseline. Uh, so this actually shows that Although we had a LED ligation protocol for the myocardial, um, for inducing the myocardial infarction, the response to the protocol is different among the different mouse. And this will be clear when we look into the quantitative result. So the, in the left graph, we have the oxygen saturation for the individual mice. Uh, as you can see for at the 30 minute case, all of them, has reduced oxygenation, but then as the mouse stabilizes, their response is quite different. But then when we look into the graph at the left, right, we see that the oxygenation uh, at the post-surgery cases is statistically significantly lower compared to the baseline case. Then uh, we also did a pilot hypoxia study to understand the sensitivity of the system. So what we did was that we first imaged the uh, healthy mice using room air. So and in, the, in the video being played now, we can see there is some oxygenation inside the myocardium within the ROI. Then we reduced the oxygenation and provided with 10% oxygenation. And then as you can see in the anterior myocardium, you don't see much of oxygenation. But what is interesting is that when we change our oxygen from 10% to 21%, you can see there is a transition of oxygenation and there is a recovery of oxygenation. So this pilot study actually gave us confidence that the, the, the ki kind of change that we're seeing in our ischemia, the system is sensitive enough to that kind of change. Uh, so this is quantitatively showing our sensitivity analysis result. So at 21%, we see high oxygenation and then at 10% it goes down. And then when we um, made our transition, we see during the transition period, there is a recovery and then there is a saturation of oxygenation. So uh, here I'm summarizing our result from the 2D echocardiographic measurement. So we looked into ejection fraction, fraction shorting, stroke volume, and found out that the, each of these parameters is um, different um, compared post-surgery cases is different compared to the baseline. And we have, through the ANOVA analysis, we have found out that this difference is actually statistically significant with p-value less than 0 0.001. Then we also looked in part from the coercion analysis with our oxygen saturation measurement. And we have found out that the oxygen saturation measurements are E, uh, positively linearly correlated with ejection fraction, fraction shortening, and stroke volume with statistically significant p-value. So I, here I'm try, again uh, reiterating the challenges and the limitation of the uh, current experiment. So first of all, we use a high persistent value to get reliable signal. So the, when we use very high um, persistent value, we actually lost sensitivity to less uh, to small variation because we were taking a frame average of 10. Then there were also challenges from the presence of bubble and the reverberation artifact. And 
there was an effect of suture after surgery as shown in this image. We are losing a lot of signal due to the suture. And finally, we had a limited field of view. We were able, only able to image the anterior myocardium. And this is one of the fundamental uh, limit. This is coming from the fundamental limitation of PA imaging itself. So summarizing the key results of this experiment. So we found out that there is a significant reduction in myocardial perfusion post-surgery compared to the baseline. Um, there is a positive linear relationship between the perfusion changes derived from the PA and the conventional echocardiography measurements. And this experiment uh, and study actually show that there is a potential of PA imaging or as a real-time imaging modality for investigating neural models and you know, of ischemia, myocardial ischemia. So uh, now, till now, I have talked about the principle of PA imaging and shown the in vivo experimentation on the mouse model of ischemia and hypoxia. Now I will transition to the cardiac elastography portion of the presentation. So first of all, what is ultrasound elastography? So it is a technique of estimating the relative tissue stiffness using ultrasound imaging. So for example, let's consider a simple case where we have a stiff inclusion in a soft medium. So what we can do is that, first of all, we, without providing any kind of compression, we can collect a, a, an ultrasound image of this uh, inclusion. And then we can apply some kind of motion by some kind of compression by moving the probe. So this, this and then again collect an ultrasound image. Then we will consider this as a post compression image. Now we have two pre and post compression image. So as the inclusion is harder compared to the background, so for the same amount of pressure, the inclusion is going to move less compared to the background. So if we can estimate what is the displacement of different point with, from these two images, then we can get a profile like this over depth. So this profile actually showing that at the background, we are having high displacement. And then within the inclusion, we are not seeing much of a displacement. And then again at the background, we are seeing very high displacement. If we take a derivative of this profile, we get a elastogram like this. So what is the elastogram is showing us? It's actually showing us what is the relative stiffness. So at the uh, inclusion is showing us background because it is stiffer compared to the background. So this is the basic elastography process. So we are mostly interested into the cardiac elastography. So the cardiac elastography has the similar principle as the quasi-static elastography, but the difference is that the tissue motion is actually induced physiologically. In the previous slides, we were moving the transducer to induce a motion, but here the motion is directly coming from the movement of the heart. For example, here I have an image of end diastole frame and an image of the same heart at N systole. And then what we can do is that we can take our image block and try to find out where that block move to the N systole frame. And by com doing this for entire image, we can derive what is the, we can estimate, a, um, we can estimate the cardiac motion. And estimating the cardiac motion, we can generate this strain. And from that strain, we can quantify strain rate and look into the myocardial functional information. So for liter literature review, there are many groups who actually are currently investigating RF-based cardiac strain estimation techniques. Our group is one of those. And we have previously proposed a Lagrangian cardiac strain estimation algorithm for short axis view of the heart. Currently, we are focusing more to extend our work also for the long axis view. So this is our cardiac elastography pipeline. So we start off by acquiring raw RF signal. So in my experiment, I am using the Vivo 2100 system to performing the acquisition. Then we take one cardiac cycle and try to estimate what is the cardiac motion by processing each of the consecutive frame. So one of the key point of this pipeline is the local displacement estimation. So this is actually estimating what is the incremental displacement between two consecutive frames. 
and we repeat this for one entire cardiac cycle. And after we perform this local displacement stimulation motion, we provide our initial segmentation at end diastole of epicardial and endocardial wall. And then using the derived motion from step two and segmentation of step three, we accumulate our displacement and take the strain of our accumulated displacement and then generate this strain profile to look into the myocardial functions. So a little bit detail about the local displacement estimation algorithm, so which is the cornerstone of this cardiac elastography pipeline. So we employ a course to find approach for displacement tracking. So what is meant by that? It's meant by that is that after performing the image acquisition, we build this multi-resolution pyramid. So here I am sure we are looking into four different level. So at the level two, we have a very low resolution image. And then we use this low resolution image to get a rough idea of displacement that's present in the tissue. And then as we go lower uh, in the, into the lower level, we increase our image resolution and use information from the previous level to improve our displacement um, um, motion tracking accuracy. So in particular, um, for each level, we employ 2D normalized cross correlation as a measure of the similarity metric. Here is an ex example of that. So we have this e B mode image, we create this 2D block, and then we have this pre-image and post-image. Then if we try to, generate the similarity metric using the 2D normalized cross correlation technique. And normally what is done is that we, you just find out what is the peak value of this cross correlation function and did and say that, okay, shift X is my lateral displacement and shift Y is my um, axial displacement. But we also use this cross correlation function in a Bayesian framework to improve our motion technique, uh, motion estimation accuracy which is termed as Bayesian regularization in our technique. So further detail can be found out in the paper cited in this slide. And we, for the current experiment, we are also looking into the um, speckle tracking in echocardiography. In particular, we are using the uh, speckle tracking echocardiography algorithm implemented in vivo strain from Visosonics. So here is a screenshot of Viso, uh, vivo strain. So the Processing pipeline is very simple. So the user um, chose a one cardiac cycle or two cardiac cycle for processing. And then they draw this endocardial and epicardial wall. And then the software automatically track this microdial wall. And then it reports microdial velocity, displacement, strain, and strain rate. So in current study, we are mostly interested by to compare the displacement and the strain. So here is one initial in vivo result of our method. So here, uh, this is a healthy mouse case. Um, here, um, the, you can see the screenshot at, of the radial displacement at end systole and the longitudinal displacement at end systole. And then this is the segmental profile. So we, we look into the six different segments around the entire myocardium and then generate this profile. And by looking to the estimated displacement, you can see uh, that there is a uh, there is a periodic variation as this is a healthy case, but there is also a variation among the different segments. And then we use this accumulated displacement to generate the radial strain and the longitudinal strain as shown here. And finally, we did a initial comparison against vivo strain. And here I am reporting two cases. So in case one uh, for the uh, here is the result for radial strain. So as you can see, most both of the cases are actually showing pretty comparable result. And this is a case for the longitudinal strain. And again, there is a, uh, some discrepancy between them, but they might be uh, for, uh, because um, the, in a cardiac elastography, we are making the use of RF signal, whereas in vivo strain, they're using the machine B mode. And also there, there might be a little bit difference between the segmentation that's being done in our pipeline and their pipeline. So summarizing uh, the discussion key results from cardiac elastography section. So we discussed the basic principle of cardiac elastography and then also shared the current framework that is providing the in vivo results comparable to the vivo strain. 
and we are currently um, investigating the ischemia cases um, to look into any kind of difference and how close the two methods are in those cases. So here is an acknowledgement. I acknowledge my funding source for, from NIH for my research and also the Carbon Cancer Center for the small animal imaging and analysis facility. And I also acknowledge the uh, thank Visosonics for allowing me for the webinar and, um, and also helping us with the P-imaging protocol and cardiovascular physiology core facility for helping with the small animal model and the surgery. And finally, my ultrasound lab group members for helping with the analysis and the critical discussion of the research. Um, thank you very much for your patience here. <laughs> Great, thanks, Rashid. That's a, a really great overview. You're doing some really interesting work there. I, I like uh, it's very promising the the way that uh, you've got some combinations there of some of the existing tools like uh, cardiac strain analysis and and also some of the really uh, cutting edge advanced um, stuff that's uh, that's going on in photoacoustic imaging. So yeah. we've got uh, we've got some questions that have okay. uh, come in here so i'll just uh, start at the at the top here at the first question that uh, came in um, one of the attendees would like to know um, regarding the um, photoacoustic uh, part of the talk uh, mm -hmm. if you see any normal healthy blood signal uh, pa signal upstream of the suture placement uh, can you repeat the question the uh, the question was whether or not you see any normal healthy um, signal from from PA from blood you know, on PA rather um, that is upstream of where the suture is placed. Uh, in the first of all, in the normal case, there is no presence of the suture, mm -hmm. uh, uh, so we we actually see signal there uh, when there is no pre when there is no suture. Um, the places where we are actually losing signal, we actually uh, see, let me go back to the image. So you can actually see signal uh, where normally we lo lose signal due to the PA at the baseline case, we actually see signal. And then we are also using an HBT threshold. So, so that actually is not any kind of signal that is also coming from the chamber that is not reflected because we, due to that thresholding operation. So we, any kind of signal that's below the threshold is considered noise and being filtered out. Yeah. Mm, okay, I see, that's interesting. Mm -hmm. um, kind of a follow-up question, uh, again, related specifically to the photoacoustics portion. Mm -hmm. um, how, I, there's some interest in the methods that you use to determine um, the values for uh, gain and um, persistence uh, during the photoacoustic um, uh, acquisitions. Could you kind of go over that again? Yeah, so it, it was actually empirical. So we tried different kind of gain setting and settle on that. But what we have found out that, um, um, so our main goal at the baseline was to maximize the signal intensity from the anterior myocardium. So First of all, um, there were some specific guidelines from the Visasonics about the placement of the skin surface and where you need to put the RY. And when you get, when you say, when when you are when you are done with that kind of setting, then we were mainly concentrated to see that okay, now we went to the oxyhemo mode and tried to maximize what is the signal intensity here. So we started off with no persistent, no frame averaging, and then what we have found out that. We were actually getting some kind of signal, but then the signal intensity was not, uh, there, there are more noise compared to the signal because most of the application of PA till now is basically for, I have seen a lot of example in tumor imaging and that's a start, static object. So it's very easier to, there is no motion, but in the cardiac case, we are, we are having very high motion. So that motion is introducing a lot of noise. So that's why we um, try to provide with higher gain setting, a uh, persistence setting, and then we settle at ten. Uh, the, at the ten, we started uh, getting good images. So, yeah. I see. I see. Interesting. All mm -hmm. right. Um, 
There's a question here, uh, actually, that, that I can handle. Um, somebody was, uh, is asking if um, photoacoustics uh, can be applied to 4D imaging on the 3100 system. Mm -hmm. So the, the answer on that one is not yet, uh, yet being the key word there. That is something that uh, we're working on, um, bringing um, those two modes together, photoacoustic imaging and, and 4D imaging. Uh, on the so it'll be on the laser X platform uh, on the vivo 3100 uh, it doesn't look like anything like that is going to be possible on the the older um, 2100 slash laser platform mainly due to um, processing power and uh, gating and, and, and issues with the the laser so uh, yes that that is something that we're, we're working on don't have a clear timeline on it yet it's quite a, a challenging problem um, to to sort out but we are definitely um, could you comment on um, the difference between some of the cardiac elastography work um, that you went over versus um, the regular um, sort of clinically standard strain rate, um, strain and strain rate analysis uh, imaging? I, I mean, as, as we know, strain and strain rate is... Uh, assessment is really becoming um, a clinical standard now right. and there's a uh, there's always been a lot of interest in elastography and tissue characterization and I'm uh, just one some, some some just some questions here wondering uh, what's the added value of um, the tissue characterization and the elastography over what's uh, currently available yeah so uh, the base primary goal of the both Spec ultracardiography echocardiography and the cardiac elastography is same. We wanted to extract what is the strain and the strain rate to look into the myocardial dysfunction. But the difference being is that for the um, STE, like most of the uh, implementation, they use the B mode images. Whereas when we are part from the cardiac elastography, we make use of the raw RF signal. So what is the advantage of this? So in the FEA, like finite element analysis models and also the phantom experiment, it has been found out that if you use the envelope uh, compared to the, if you use the raw RF signal compared to the B mode or the envelope signal, uh, your, your motion estimation accuracy is a higher compared to just tracking the B mode image. So that's one thing. The other thing is that when you are tracking the B mode image, you are sensitive to only large motion but when you are tracking the raw rf signal due to the presence of the high frequency component you are also sensitive to the small subtle motion and i think like in a small rapidly beating heart like mouse it is very crucial to detect like smaller motion so i think like cardiac elastography can provide with added value in looking into like the that small variation even within the microdial wall where, where the cardiac elastography is sensitive. So I think there is the boundary that added um, accuracy and also the added sensitivity. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I agree. I, I, some of the, the work, some of the early work that I've seen in, in uh, myocardial elastography assessment, it, it looks um, like it's, it's just sort of adding another layer of, uh, of information onto what's, right. what's already there. Um, it right. could, be, could be quite powerful. There's always been a lot of promise in some of the elastography and tissue characterization work. Um, it'd, be, uh, it'd be very interesting to see how, how that plays out. Um, there's a couple of questions here um, just re regarding what you can comment on about the um, resolution, the spatial and temporal resolution of, um, of the photoacoustics uh, imaging. So, um the resolution, um, temporal resolution, uh, as we are again, um, as we were using very high fr um, uh, frame persistence, that means we are basically averaging a lot. We lost spare resolution both in the spatial and the temporal domain. Because uh, what do I mean by that? Like, so um, first of all, like when we are seg when we are doing the segmentation and then when we are reporting, we don't have any definition of exactly at which part of the cardiac cycle we are because we are taking signal from different part of the cardiac cycle and then just taking average of them. So that's why we are losing our um, temporal resolution. And then 
it's again for the frame averaging technique so as we are averaging or different frame from different location so things get started to get become smoother so we we, we don't we, we also lose spatial resolution and i can validate that because like um, uh, we try to look into the micro anterior microdium segmentally using our current protocol but then we found out that um, there is not no new information and then we whatever we are finding it's actually um, um, it does not um, it, it's very hard to explain the it's not the expected behavior from a, a segment and analysis so i think the reason being is that although we are looking into the apex but then the, the apical signal is has contribution from the base also so that's why i'm saying that we we'll lose a lot of spatial resolution also during the during this scheme that we have mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I suppose that that leads, that leads to another question that's sort of more um, more kind of blue sky off, off in the future um, mm. about the possible value of photoacoustic imaging um, in cardio uh, in general, not just in cardio research, but uh, but clinically in cardio. There's always been some some concern and thoughts around the uh, rep rate of the laser and and the depth of light penetration, which uh, you alluded to um, in the PA part when you were talking about mainly getting signal from the yeah. anterior as opposed to the posterior. So um, as, as somebody who's, you know, quite deep in the field of photoacoustic research, you know, what, what do you see kind of blue sky off in the, in, in the distance as a, as a possible applications? Um, right now, DM, in the current state of the technology, it will be very hard to just translate the same technique to the clinic to look into because like uh, here currently we were imaging at the depth of say 11 millimeter and then we were only limited limited to the yeah um only to the anterior myocardium and also in the uh, but i think like not only the it has a uh, higher prospect into the other like more um yeah, like tissue imaging or the imaging the uh, vasculature of the um, surface near the skin. So there, like it, it can be. Uh, there are some publications also in the human study where people were try to uh, look into the uh, the mic vasculature and the, also the oxygen saturation in the uh, in, in the artery near the skin surface. So there, I see a prospect of the like immediate clinical translation. But I think that we need to do further research and try to find out a better way of light delivery so that we can uh, get like higher penetration of the optical energy to get readable signal and then translate this method to in clinical setting. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that that certainly seems to be some of the some of the issues that, that need to be surmounted. Yeah. I know. Certainly speaking, putting my product manager hat back on, that's certainly something we at Visual Sonics have worked on with um, the Laser X product, you know, adding a, bringing a laser in with the system that is a higher rep rate, that's more powerful, uh, just to try to get, you know, that light, light delivery in uh, deeper and at a faster rep rate to, to try to enable some of these uh, cardio uh, imaging uh, applications. And another, another thing certainly that we're, actively researching and working on and I'm certain there's lots of others doing it as well is is um, alternative light delivery methods you know can right. we, with our with our system now it's planar right we're just bringing light in mm. from one surface can we bring light in from the bottom and the top at the same time or the top and the side and, and what sort of gains does that uh, does that get? Right. Um, so yeah there's certainly lots of lots of possibilities and certainly on the current platform at least that we have it's uh, a little more flexible a little more powerful than uh, what we had in the, in the in the old days, so to speak. A um, couple more questions here. I think that we've probably got time to get to, and then we'll uh, probably wrap it up. Um, one question uh, asking if uh, you've made any attempt to correlate the chronotropic effects of ischemia along with the elasticity analysis that you've been doing. Uh, no, but this is currently uh, we are investigating that. 
Yeah, that, that I think would be, would be really yeah. interesting. I mean, there's... that is one of the points of further validation. So we want to see that uh, is there any relationship between those two? And we expect to see some. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, one question here that I can, I can field um, for photo, just specifically for photoacoustic imaging. Somebody is, is asking if um, it can be used to determine myoglobin oxygen saturation. So uh, the answer is, is, is yes, pretty much any tissue that you can look at that you can get access to uh, in terms of imaging access, I should say, that you can get light into, uh, you can assess oxygen saturation, uh, hemoglobin burden, uh, and then start to do more complicated things, you know, with, with dyes or other contrast agents or things. So uh, yeah, my, myoglobin uh, saturation, oxygen saturation in muscle is, is no problem whatsoever for photoacoustics. The key is always just getting the light delivery in as I mean, Rashid, as you obviously you showed with the posterior versus the anterior myocardial um, issues is just getting the, getting the light in. Um, so one final question, um, and then I think we'll wrap it up, is um, it's a question around the uh, algorithms that you're using for elastography analysis mm -hmm. um, and how those may differ or may be similar to some of the calculations that are in um, the vivo strain package, uh, whether or not the strain is being, um, is being calculated by different methods and whether you're seeing different results there. So um, I'm not sure like what algorithm specifically that's being implemented in vivo strain, but I assume that they, they are doing SDE for doing the correlation analysis, but the, um, so they were using some kind of, um, um, we are, in particular in our algorithm, we use this NCC, like 2D normalized cross correlation as a similarity measure. They can use NCC or they can also use sum of absolute difference, some other metric to look into the uh, similarity between pre and post frame. And then the other thing is that we, uh, for deriving the strain, we, we actually try to derive what is the Lagrangian strain. So in order to do that, we first derive, we estimate the interframe displacement and from there we determine what is the accumulated displacement in a Lagrangian fashion. And then from there, we use those accumulated displacement to determine strain tensor. And from the strain tensor, we determine what is the uh, radial and longitudinal strain. This is our method of doing it. I have a feeling that they use um, in the vivo strain, they actually directly use the in, the anterior and the epicardial and, and endocardial myocardium length to directly determine what is the longitudinal strain and the thickness to directly determine what is the radial thickness or radial strain. So that might be one of the reasons that uh, we were seeing some kind of difference between the two techniques. I can, and I, I can actually partially speak to that. Um, if, if memory serves, I believe, and, and I, I should remember this because there's a, a, a Vivo Strain user manual that's yeah. available on our customer website. I should remember because I think I wrote part of it. Um, I believe that the model in the Vivo Strain package is uh, Eulerian um, strain okay. as opposed to Lagrangian strain. Okay. And again, going from memory here, um, a lot of the... Uh, Algorithms that are in the vivo strain package are uh, some of the the, the wide the, the sort of more widely uh, currently anyway widely used clinical tools, which I think are based on Eulerian strain. Which if you go back far enough, there's some work from um, Gianni Pedrazzetti at the University of Trieste in Italy uh, okay. published a number of papers on those calculations, and I think a lot of those have formed the basis for. Um, the clinical strain analysis packages. So not only vivo strain, but if you look at um, GE and um, Phillips and yeah. some of the other, I, th I believe a lot of those strain analysis packages are based on the Eulerian model as opposed to the Lagrangian model. Yeah, I mean, recently like uh, them. So this is one other aspect is that there were one um, recent publication from a, uh, from a European group where they tried to standardize these tech different uh, strain estimation techniques. And one of the recommendation was to look into the Lagrangian strain. So that's why like we were, we were actually like more 
interested to look into the uh, Lagrangian strain estimation result and propose our technique. So there's mm -hmm. one added point. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that sounds about right. I see there's actually a couple more questions popping in here okay. on uh, on strain estimation and, and strain analysis and the strain okay. maps. Um, one thing I would direct uh, anybody to who is using the Vivo strain package that we have from Visual Sonics or is interested in it, there is a webinar um, on uh, several webinars on our website and on our YouTube channel. I think the most the most recent one I can't remember if I hosted it. And presented it or if it was somebody else there are a couple on there that uh, delve into the vivo strain package um, placing points running the analysis and the types of data that you can and, and maybe shouldn't um, analyze with strain um, and sure. the interpretation of some of the data so um, for any of the attendees out there that are interested please um, uh, dig into that and and, uh, and have a look and then there's also documentation on our website um, yeah is look, worth looking into definitely okay great uh, we are getting up to the top of the hour here so um, I think we'll cut it off for today I just um, took sharing back uh, Rashid thank yeah. you again for uh, the talk it's a, a great overview really interesting work to see you know photoacoustics and, and, and standard strain uh, cardiac analysis and some advanced cardiac analysis all kind of being put together to, to make a really nice package. So thank you for the, uh, the overview. Um, thanks everybody for, for attending. Um, we uh, have tons of resources on our website, so please do check out our website, visualsonics.com. Um, there's a, a resource portal for uh, customers. You just request a login, you sign in, there's lots of documentation there. Um, even if you're not an existing customer, there are tools in there where you can um, submit questions to us uh, and uh, request any support. Uh, lots of webinars on the website. Uh, we are posting them uh, on YouTube or on, on social as uh, lots of uh, organizations are these days. Our YouTube channel is uh, becoming, getting more and more built out all the time now. It's becoming a great resource for uh, some of these webinars and uh, presentations. Uh, another uh, bit of uh, useful information that you'll find on our website is lists of conferences and society meetings and events that we are at. We do lots and lots of major conferences, minor conferences, really, really small ones, uh, all the way up through to the, the quite large society meetings. So if you're at a uh, conference and uh, you see a booth, stop by and uh, ask us lots of questions. We always have... Um, our booth staffed with uh, both um, both uh, staff, uh, sales staff, and uh, to answer any sales questions. And there's always application staff. Sometimes they even let the product managers travel to the meetings, and uh, we get to, to talk about future developments and things like that. So um, lots of great information there. Another thing that's not on um, this slide are the travel awards. Uh, we just opened up um, the windows for the 2019 travel awards. So we do have um, a number of different subsections for travel awards, cardio, cancer, molecular imaging, and a few others. Uh, send us your submissions, uh, any conferences that you want to go to, presentations that you're giving at the conferences, whether it's a poster or an oral. Uh, we, we like to see those and we have a, a, an expert judging panel who goes through and for each uh, type of submission, cardio cancer, we do pick one or two uh, winners and those winners do get a, uh, a, a small uh, bursary to uh, help out, to help to defer some of those travel costs to go to those meetings because, you know, in science, those meetings are really important to go to. So we like to try and support everybody uh, to do that. So with that, we will wrap it up. Thank you again, everybody, for uh, attending. As I mentioned off the top, we will be sending out a recording of the, the webinar for anybody that was interested. Um, Rashid, thank you again for the, the great presentation. And uh, we will see you all again uh, very soon on the next webinar. Bye for now.